And uh, it really is important to, to work out which of these three mechanisms is going on. And it's absolutely essential to look at the angle. You, you could say, uh, just going back, you could say in this patient, well, you're not going to look at the angle. There's no angle to see. But in general, uh, there's a lot to see in the angle in uveitis, and you do need to look carefully. And this is a typical chronic, chronic synechial closure that you see, these broad PAS, um, much more extensive than you might see in chronic anterior uh, synechii from uh, chronic angle closure, a primary chronic angle closure. And um, you might see these occasional bridging synechii. These are, these are classic in uveitis. They look a bit more like Axenfeld syndrome than anything else, but, uh, but they're not so significant because they, happen, they occur whenever you get acute anterior uveitis and uh, the pressure goes down and there's a lot of fibrin and the patient develops some synechs. You treat the uveitis, it gets better, pressure goes back to normal and the angle opens and they're left with the occasional bridging synech. That's rarely a, a cause of serious angle closure. A more insidious cause is um, sarcoid nodules and patients with, uh, especially young black patients with, a, with acute anterior uveitis, you can actually find sar sarcoid no nodules in the angle, which can be diagnostic of the problem. But when these untreated lead to synechii as well, an angle closure. And then of course, there's a patient with the angle is completely normal. And this is the patient where you might think Prognostically, it's much more likely to be a steroid response if you've got high pressure. Wide open, a little bit of pigment, nothing much going on. That might simply be a steroid response. Folks, is interesting. Um, you see these little vessels in the angle, and when present, these are diagnostic. It's rare to see as many as you do here. This is, um, this is unusual. These are the vessels that cause Am Amsler sign when they do. And it's typically, if you see them, there's only one or two in the angle. This patient had about a dozen or two dozen, which is very unusual. But you can see they're not at all like normal neovascularization. They do cross scleral spur, and they are for sure neovascular, but uh, they don't cause anterior synechii, unlike any other form of, uh, uh, um, any other form of synechii. Then, of course, there's open angles. Patients have completely normal angles. It might be steroid response, but there are other... Um, types and you do need some pattern recognition skills to work out. There's obviously folks have just mentioned there's Posner Schlossman syndrome, whatever that is, CMV. It's a, a mixed bag of things. Herpetic keratoeuveitis, patients who have open angles and uh, and you, you and a high risk of long-term pressure problems that you might miss if you don't watch them closely. I, I tend to focus on quite a lot on folks because we still see quite a lot of folks in the UK and it was typically badly diagnosed in the past. And it's important because it does not require uh, aggressive uh, steroid therapy and aggressive steroid therapy can just put the pressure up. So you have to differentiate it from patients who do need aggressive steroid therapy. It's often misdiagnosed, missed, or the glaucoma potential underestimated. A typical, uh, folks patients get a lot of um, uh, floaters and I, a pattern I used to see uh, was patients who would go privately to floaters removed and the vitreo retinal surgeon wouldn't see them routinely for very many follow-up appointments and they wouldn't get that there was a high risk of glaucoma after the vitrectomy in these patients. And the patient would typically appear in the glaucoma clinic uh, months and months later, having had an untreated pressure of 30 or 40 for a long time. So folks, if they have floaters for uh, vitrectomy for floaters, need to be watched afterwards commonly causes recalcitrant glaucoma requiring surgery and filtration surgery. Surprisingly, despite the fact that Fuchs is not severely inflammatory, filtration surgery is less effective than it is in other types of uveitis. When I was training, people would typically talk about the KP in Fuchs, the distribution and appearance, which is typical, but it's not actually definitive. These um, brown-eyed patients with Fuchs get the nodules at the uh, margin of the, the iris, and these are very typical. Um, and quite, you can see this iris appearance is quite unusual. And this is very typical of folks. And this is the normal eye. That's the abnormal eye. Normal eye, abnormal eye. And you can see the difference in the nodules and also the colorette. The little colorette pupillary rough is missing in the folks eye. You see the difference uh, between the normal eye and the abnormal eye. Um, again, you can see the, the nodules uh, at, at the colorette, not at the pupil margin, as in here. 
it, there's a, a lot of little uh, nodules. Again, uh, th this is very typical of the brown-eyed uh, Fuchs patient, especially Asian patients with Fuchs and African patients with Fuchs. It tends to be a bit more florid than in the white patients. The white blue-eyed patients get this amazing pattern of iris depigmentation, which is, uh, I liken it to termites or something uh, eating at the iris. And the really surprising thing is that you can see that the pupil still reacts. The, um, there is a fibrotic band around the pupil, but it doesn't stick down, it's still reacting. Yet they have this dramatic iris transillumination, uh, literally like some little, um, some little mite has been nibbling away at the pigment epithelium uh, of the iris. And very surprisingly, uh, they don't get pigment in the angle. Now you might say, well, transillumination is not that uncommon. This is um, transillumination in, um, in acute anterior uveitis, but you can see here that the Irish sphincter is shot to pieces. It's completely destroyed. And the transillumination pattern is much more uniform around the periphery. This is pigment dispersion syndrome. The iris pupil is normal. The texture, the surface of the iris is normal. The stroma is normal but you get these spoke-like uh, transillumination, completely different from Fuchs. You also get the floaters, as I mentioned, and the floaters and Fuchs can be very debilitating to the extent that people do need them removed. Uh, I've had patients where I've taken out the cataract and the floaters have still been so dense that, that the patient couldn't see any better despite the cataract surgery. And uh, the tip typical floaters and Fuchs, as I say, do lead the patients sometimes to the retinal surgeon and the retinal surgeon doesn't always get the high risk of glaucoma, and, you can, and that can be missed. But as I mentioned before, the, the, there's some the very unusual things about Fuchs. The uh, iris transillumination, the only condition where you get iris transillumination but don't see any uh, pigment in the angle. Posner Schlossman is a typical differential, um, usually very little to see, one or two KP, one or two cells, nothing very much, very high pressure. And uh, Fuchs, on the other hand, as I mentioned, uh, going back a little bit, there's, I showed you these vessels, but this is the only condition where you get iris transillumination and literally no pigment in the angle. Where's the pigment go? It's not going into the angle or else it's going in so slowly it's getting uh, transported away. So there's a few diagnostic things in uveitis. That, you know, it is worth looking at the patients carefully. It's not just uh, the, the disc and the, um, and the field as we normally are concentrating on in glaucoma. So this is, this is Gary Holland's slides. As I mentioned, he's a, a giant in the field of uveitis, the guy who as a medical student um, ca uh, discovered, car recognized, characterized and described CMV re retinitis and AIDS in Los Angeles in the early 80s. And uh, there has been, there are very few decent epidemiological studies of, of uveitis and uveitic glaucoma. And this is a Kaiser Permanente looked at the incidence of, or the prevalence of IP elevation in uveitis. And it seems to be about 15% across the board. If you look at most studies, they're based on clinics, not epidemiology. And very, very often glaucoma is defined very poorly. Many studies in the past have just said patient has glaucoma. That's the, the those were the, um, the, the the diagnostic characteristics. Um, chronic uh, versus recurrent, um, much, much higher risk in chronic rather than recurrent disease. Um, odds ratio of 23, quite spectacular. Uh, but many, many are combined mechanisms, a bit of open angle, a bit of closed angle. And uh, th this is interesting. If you look at children, it's obviously uh, the, the proportion getting high pressure is much higher. By, if you've got a child by eight, eight years into uveitis, you've got a 40%, more than 40% risk of high, high pressure elevation. Whereas across the board, it's probably only about 15%. This is interesting because flare seems to correlate inversely with aqueous outflow. So more flare, less outflow. And if you've got um, high flare, you have a high risk of IOP elevation. And that, that just that's a bi uh, divides patients bimodally into those with the high flare and low flare uh, on one cutoff. And you can see the IOP elevation uh, risk is much, much higher. It's, it's going from, uh, sorry, my camera's in the way of the slide. It's going from um, 
by 10% to about 40% in those with high flare. So disorders in which IOP, there are some disorders in which IOP elevation occurs at the onset of inflammation and you treat the inflammation it gets better. <clears throat> so not always due to steroid response, can be due to the inflammation. And these are typically, of course, Poster Schlossmann's defined by the high pressure, but also sarcoid, herpetic disease, toxoplasma, and syphilis, which uh, I, I never see, but does occur obviously in clinics where there's a lot of AIDS patients. In these con conditions, treating with corticosteroids actually brings the pressure down. And it's not always correlated with the level of anterior chamber inflammation. Of course, pressure problems are episodic, and that's what makes it difficult uh, to decide how aggressively to treat, because the pressure's up, then it's down, then it's up again. And with exacerbation of inflammation or with courses of steroids, the pressure can go up, can be missed on periodic examinations, and you do have to watch the disc appearance. When we audited our TRABs and uveitis, 30% of the TRABs were being done in patients with normal discs. Well, why are we doing it in normal discs? Because these people are getting a little disc asymmetry, the pressure elevations uh, intermittent, and you need to not uh, let them get severe damage from high pressure uh, by, by just uh, uh, prevaricating or procrastinating. Obviously, patients with chronic on steroids or with uh, fluoxinone implants like Alluvian uh, need, uh, need to be watched carefully. Um, and those with specific uh, disorders where the inflammation puts the pressure up. And again, you, it fuchs, as I mentioned, because it's chronic. Um, you need to aggressively treat the inflammation uh, earlier. The uveitis specialists all agree, aggressive treatment of inflammation. It doesn't matter what it's doing to the pressure, aggressively treat the inflammation and then deal with the pressure as you have to. If the pressure is a real problem, long-term immunomod immunomodulatory therapy um, can act as steering sp sparing agent, but you need to aggressively control the inflammation to start with, otherwise you end up with worse pressure problems. You've got to be careful about how you treat uveitis and steroid responders. I, I don't like the term steroid responder because pretty much everybody you give steroids to chronically will get a high pressure. Those are not steroid responders, that's just normal. It's the genetic steroid responders where they, where they get a high pressure and a week after steroids are, are real steroid responders. But either way, the, that, that uh, descriptor is academic because if the pressure goes up, if you put patients on steroids and the pressure goes up, you gotta do something about it. So steroids can be a cause of high pressure, a treatment for high pressure, and definitely a confounding factor. And uh, you, you gotta have a, 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 a a strategy uh, for dealing with this. What do steroids do to the pressure? Well, uh, that's, uh, sorry, I got too many uh, windows on my slides that I can't, can't actually see what I'm presenting. The, um, this is the hazard ratio for IOP elevation in this paper. And the, these are the effects of pills. This is if you're more than seven and a half milligrams per day, this is on your less than seven and a half milligrams per nisolone a day. This is eye drops increasing to, from one drop a day to more than two hourly. Um, this is periocular injection. Uh, this is intraocular injection. And this is alluvian retocert fluoxinolone implants. And you can see, uh, now it's worth looking at, this is a log scale. So while the, the drops don't seem to increase the pressure much, the, the, this is like a fourfold increase in pressure here. And this is a 16-fold increase in pressure. And this is a 32-fold increase in pressure. <clears throat> so, um, so steroids do increase the pressure. And systemic steroids double the pressure if it's more than 7.5 milligrams. Less than 7.5 milligrams doesn't seem to do anything, which is what you expect. Remember that your body, your physiological cortisol level in the body is roughly the equivalent of 7.5 milligrams of prednisolone a day. So if, you got, if your patient's on less than seven and a half milligrams per nisolone a day, that's actually no more than your body normally produces. Um, it's at higher levels that, that uh, are more important. And there is an inverse, although it's not directly proportional, there is an inverse relation between cells and pressure. So treatment uh, of IOP in selected conditions, corticosteroid challenge to reduce IOP isn't gonna do anything in someone with chronic anterior uveitis. So forget that, it's certain acute conditions where steroid challenge can help. 
There's no real weak role for weak steroids to avoid a corticosteroid response. Weak steroids are useful as maintenance in people who are well controlled, um, but don't allow patients of smoldering disease as that will give you tissue damage and worse uveitic glaucoma. The effect of corticosteroids is complicated in that increased inflammatory activity in the acute phase can drop the pressure as well. Patient with acute anterior uveitis, the pressure goes down. You treat them with steroids, it goes back up again. That's not a steroid response, that's just treating the inflammation. And that's independent of corticosteroid effect, although it tends to be a small effect. The modulatory effect of the inflammation itself on the IOP rise, as I mentioned, small. So don't, don't misinterpret steroid treatment as a, an IOP, as a, a response, but the response, is really, the response is really a chronic effect rather than an acute effect. So that's a recap. I mean, the important thing is that a low grade smoldering inflammation is worse than a corticosteroid induced IOP elevation. And we have glaucoma specialists to treat the IOP elevation if need be. Although it is worth asking your uveitis specialist, can this patient be on something other than the steroids? And the things that are typically used in our practice are methotrexate, um, Humira, um, Infliximab. Etanercept was used for a while, but there was a suspicion that it actually made uveitis worse. And once the IOP goes up in chronic anterior uveitis, it's almost always permanent. There are some medication uh, things to consider. We don't tend to use pilocarpine nowadays in glaucoma anyway, but, but uh, it's not very good in uveitis. Ramonidine in children is obviously bad news, respiratory suppression and drowsiness. And prostaglandin analogs. When patients get high pressure, uh, I, the doctors tend to put them in everything. And it's worth pointing out that prostaglandin analogs really screw up your uh, ability to figure out what's going on because they don't really work in active inflammation. The eyes full of prostaglandins. They don't work in Posner-Schlossman syndrome. We know that in Posner-Schlossman syndrome, the eyes full of prostaglandins. So what's the point putting in any more? Um, it's aqueous suppression that you need. And uh, although prostaglandins don't make uveitis worse, if you've got somebody with active macular edema, you, they might make that worse or make it more difficult to treat. So try and avoid prostaglandins unless they're clearly doing something. It, it really is a waste of time in a lot of uveitics. It is worth pointing out that uh, you know, treatment failures are more common in uveitis than any other glaucoma group. And it is more extreme pressure swings, uh, very high pressures, very low pressures. And uh, you may need to, they may need me chronic medical therapy as well as surgery. Uveitis in children. Children get a more dramatic steroid response than anybody else. They get a more severe inflammation, more severe pressure, and more severe steroid response. And it's important to watch the disc if they can't do fields. So that's just a summary of everything I've said from Gary's slides, and uh, that, that's from our AAO course. Um, I have very little to say in medical treatment in addition to that. Obviously, um, there are ways to you know, control the inflammation, as I mentioned, ways to control the pressure. There are some interactions you need to watch out for. Um, we use topical non-steroidals quite a lot at Moorfields um, for low-level maintenance. Um, and Gary believes very strongly that they're no use at all. And they do inter interfere with alpha agonists and prostaglandins. Uh, prostaglandins and alpha agonists both work by um, uh, feedback, positive feedback prostaglandin release and topical on steroids suppress that. So they're not, it's important not to use them in people in bromonidine or latanoprost. Reducing steroids helps the IOP, but, but if it's at the expense of good inflammatory control, you're wasting your time. It's your job to, as glaucoma specialist to fix the IOP surgically if need be, but don't compromise neuveitis control. As I say, watch out for prostaglandins in macular edema and watch out for the fact they may not be doing anything to help the pressure. And non-steroidals may block the IOP lowering effect of bromonidine, apoclonidine, and prostaglandins. Aqueous suppressants seem to work better simply because they hit the ciliary body, which is already weakened. 
It's also worth, we don't see it so many times these days, but bromomidine allergy used to be missed and can cause chronic severe brom bromomidine allergy can cause really severe uh, chronic anterior uveitis. It starts off with, you know, the allergy and the itch, and then they get atropion, and sometimes that used to be mistaken for infection or an, a just a re regular entropion, and then eventually they get the uveitis. And uh, don't, don't miss the chronic bromomidine allergy. So surgical treatment. Well, angle closure I've mentioned already. Um, forward movement, the iris lens diaphragm, uh, chronic synechial closure, pupil block. You really got to just make the clinical diagnosis very carefully. Uh, on the left here with the um, <clears throat> very shallow central anterior chamber, this was actually phacomorphic, but it could easily be forward movement, the lens eyes, the diaphragm, and uh, posterior scleritis, uh, VKH, or a condition where there's been a tight scleral buckle or gas or something. You know, it's very, very different from pupil block. You can see the pupil block, um, sorry, you can see the pupil block here is completely different, very deep central chamber compared with this very shallow central chamber. This is a no-brainer. It used to be badly uh, uh, differentiated, but there's no real excuse for getting it wrong. Forward movement, you've got to treat the cause. Most cases are iatrogenic, um, but you've got to treat inflammatory causes. And, uh, and really, as I say, it's uncommon and it's a no-brainer and, and it's treatable. Um, secondary angle closure from chronic sneakia and such like, like this, this is really a prognostic sign. This tells you in the patient with episodic eye pressure that it's not gonna go away that you need to do something surgically. So I used um, the, uh, I used the appearance of the angle and the appearance of the disc as prognosticators. You're not waiting usually to get visual field defects because in general, the patients uh, with a media opacity, fields are not so easy to do, not so accurate. And you really want to go on the, the prognosis on terms of is the IOP control gonna get better? If there's synechia, I know it's not gonna get better. Is there disc asymmetry? There's disc asymmetry, the disc suffering, you need to do something no matter what the pressure is. Again, the bridging synechiae, not so important as the, as the chronic synechiae, but these are prognostic factors rather than treatable factors. Angle closure, acute angle closure <clears throat> is a different beast. As I mentioned, this is uncommon and devastating. And you really gotta be on top of it. These people need aggressive, uh, medical therapy in terms of, in terms of uh, corticosteroids as well. So you're talking about systemic steroids if it's bilateral, because quite often this is bilateral, and uh, intra periocular steroids. You know, obviously, if you've got angle closure like this, you're not going to give them intravitreal triamcinolone because you'll make it worse uh, from, from the volume change, but you might give them periocular steroids. But this is a surgical emergency. And laser PI is a waste of time. You really shouldn't be doing laser PIs in people like this. This is a slightly different case that does help to illustrate that. This is a 47 year old Hispanic lady with secluded pupil and high IOP in her right and phacic eye. She was pseudo phacic in the other eye. And the interesting thing is when I dilated her pupil, the iris bombay disappeared in two quadrants, but not the other two. And uh, this illustrates how aqueous is loculated in these patients, the nature of the, the pathology. And you can see that uh, here uh, that she's got Bombay in one quadrant, but not the other, superior, but not inferiorly. And she's got it here um, in, in the, I can't remember, it's the uh, nasal, but not the temporal quadrants. So the posterior chamber is not a continuous space in these patients. And there's broad adhesions between the iris and lens, not just with the pupil. So it's not just sneaky at the pupil, the sneaky eye everywhere. <coughs> And you can see the adhesions here on the OCT. But more than that, you can see that it's not, it's just a thick um, boggy iris, not just adhesions. And it's like little cysts here and there. It's not somewhere where you can just laser and get, uh, and get uh, uh, a sudden reduction in pressure. Also, as I showed you earlier, the iris is stuck against the cornea. If you laser the iris, you're lasering the cornea. Not only is it stuck, it's stuck with fibrin. So if you laser it and you make a hole, the iris doesn't fall back, still stuck to the trabecular measure. And um, because 
it's glued, it's sticky. It's uh, not it's not fibrosed yet. It's not permanently adherent yet. It's just stuck with fibrin. So in this kind of eye, where the uh, where the aqueous is like syrup, if you laser, and you can see it, these patients come to me already with failed lasers, and someone has tried to laser this one three times and got nowhere. And uh, that you can see, you can see how the iris is stuck to the cornea. Even lasering it, even if you've got a successful iridotomy, the iris is not going to peel away from the cornea. It's just going to stay there stuck. You've got to go in and physically separate it. These patients need surgery. This patient had successful laser iridotomies, but, and that did get rid of the Bombay, fortunately in this case, but what it didn't do was open the angle. So this patient's got three patent iridotomies, no Bombay, but a completely zipped up angle. If the surgeon in this case had gone to the operating theater and actually done a surgical iridectomy, they could have visco uh, opened the angle and that patient would now have an open angle, not a closed angle. So laser PI is often ineffective and you really need to operate surgically. And there's a good paper in the British Journal of Ophthalmology in January of this year by um, uh, Sonia Bennett and co in, uh, in Auckland uh, showing that. And Gary Holland and I actually did an accompanying editorial uh, which you can read in the same issue. It's uh, actually page one of the first issue of the BJO this year. So you go to the operating theater and you try and do a traditional surgical iridectomy. We typically did them through the peripheral cornea, but it's very hard. Again, the iris is stuck to the cornea. So you need to go in with a lot of helon and peel the iris off the cornea. And then you might, uh, you might try and break the sneaky eye, which, uh, and you, and you, and slowly you get mobilized the iris and very, very slowly, you, you, you can do the surgical iridectomy. So surgical iridectomy is not easy here. You can say I'm fiddling around trying to get the iris separate because the iris is so fixed, stuck to the pupil, uh, stuck, sorry, stuck to the cornea that I couldn't actually move it to get it out. <clears throat> and then eventually, um, this video, I must point out, it's been trimmed a lot. Um, you, you pull it, eventually you can mobilize, mobilize the iris and do an iridectomy and it takes a long time and it's not very fruitful but uh, you can get out. Breaking posterior sneakii, here's another case, breaking posterior sneakii is not essential but not an unreasonable thing to do and typically you can either do the iridectomy first and go through it with the cannula or you can break it like this but if the adhesions are weak break the sneakii but breaking the sneakii remember they can reform and also as you'll see here this is another case which was a pseudofake, and this can occur in pseudofakes too. You break the sneaky eye here, and you actually can traumatize the iris root and cause bleeding. So you need to be quite careful um, not to pull too hard. I, even though I'm using blunt instrument here, you can see that there's, so you've got a uh, trauma to the iris root. So you want to avoid that. In fact, breaking the sneaky eye isn't absolutely essential. Now, what I've just done here is essential. This is the one thing that makes surgical iridectomy better than laser iridotomy. This one maneuver where you go in with viscoelastic and you just push the iris back out of the angle. It's as simple as that. That's the one thing that differentiates surgical iridectomy from uh, laser iridotomy is, is that you can viscoelastic open the angle. And uh, you just go around with Helon GV or thick uh, a cohesive viscoelastic and literally just push open the angle. You don't physically do anything with, to the iris. This is not goniosneakiolysis. This is viscogoniosneakiolysis. You're just squirting viscoelastic into the angle and hoping that you can peel the semi-stuck iris off the trabecular meshwork. And then you do um, your iridectomy and you can do it the, way, the traditional way. You can do it with a vitrector. My favorite way is using um, vitrectomy scissors and forceps because this is a this way it gives you very good visualization and control. And typically, now the vitrectomy scissors are quite small. These are 23 gauge, I think. And you make a little, tear off a little tag. You then have to take the instruments out and swap them around and take off the last bit. But you can see you can make quite a neat uh, little vitrectomy using the, using the, the scissors and forceps. And in a second, uh, 
Um, yeah, okay. And, this, and here, then you reverse the process and take off the little tag that's left behind. But arguably, this is not the most important part of the procedure. This is to stop it recurring. A decent surgical iridectomy hopefully will stop it recurring. But it's this going open the angle that, that, that really prevents you ending up with this situation where you've got the patent iridotomies, but a completely closed angle. That, that's what you need to avoid. The patient who has the successful iridotomy, but the angle's closed. The one thing that the surgery does is allows you to open with viscoelastic. What about actual gonioceniculisis? This was a young 23-year-old Canadian woman who came to me a quite a few years ago. She needed a tube, her, she had bad uveitic glaucoma, but she had been managed as a child in Canada with um, goniotomy. And that had worked very well for about 15 years until, and then she eventually needed a tube. But uh, in ch childhood, goniotomy can help. In adulthood, it doesn't work. Things like trabectome, which are basically goniotomy, don't provide lasting uh, pressure lowering. And as uh, Ho Ching Lin in Singapore in this publication showed that PAS had a negative impact on success. The one thing that gonial surgery is supposed to do is relieve PAS, but in fact, the ones with PAS were the ones that did worst. What do you do in these cases? Well, I started getting referred patients who were almost had secluded pupils, but not quite, saying, would you do an iridotomy? And the answer that Gary Holland uh, and I feel strongly is you don't do an iridotomy because if you do, uh, if you divert aqueous, the aqueous going through these gaps is what's keeping the pupils open here. And if you divert the aqueous through an iridotomy, you might get precipitate angle closure. By all means, if you want to do full surgical iridectomy or take out the cataract, but don't do laser iridotomy. So remember, this is a devastating blinding condition that's nothing like primary angle closure. And that's really a summary of the angle closure. Filtration surgery. Well, what surgery? Tubes, traps, something else. My uveitic glaucoma clinic was set up in 1996 because a retrospective study <coughs> published at Moorfield showed that the uveitics sent to the glaucoma service were getting lost and their traps were doing terribly badly. They were just ending up in the normal glaucoma clinic and not really getting looked after. Tubes work well in uveitis. There's plenty of papers to show that. So why do traps fail? Well, one is inflammatory episodes. They have conjunctival inflammation that David Broadway clearly showed, and they get cataracts. And cataracts are a big issue in uveitis. This is a 16-year-old with a light perception cataract. And it's important for two reasons. One is it really screws up filtration for, uh, surgery. We know that. And the second reason is that I've seen two or three people over the years who have, whose uveitic glaucoma has not been controlled because their disc cupping was missed because they had bad cataracts. And people were waiting to take out the cataract. The pressures were 30 odd. And when the cataract came out, they had 0.9 discs and bad visual fields at, at 30 years old. And this mustn't happen. You've got to take that cataract out early so the patient can see. But on the other hand, if they do have a bad pressure problem, you've got to fix it first and take the cataract later, act out later. What we all agreed on in glaucoma at Moorfields is you don't do combined surgery. It's a, it's a mess. Cataract surgery is inflammatory. Cataract surgery in uveitics is more inflammatory and it's difficult to get the trab right. We do our standard Moorfields trabeculectomy but you use more sutures than usual because these people are young and they're prone to hypotony. <clears throat> uh, surprisingly, when we audited our results, the results were actually very good. Having said that, we're quite selective in who we do traps on. We do a lot of tubes as well. And, uh, but in the selected cases, we were getting approximately 80% success rate at four years, which was the median survival, median uh, follow-up in this group. The only thing that really seemed to prejudice the outcome was actually cataract surgery or lens status. If the patients were pseudophagic to start with, <coughs> they did worse than if they were phagic to start with. In fact, the ones that had a cataract that we took out later actually did better than the ones who had the trab done after the cataract surgery. Pseudophagia does do something to your eye. Um, and it didn't matter which way around. Those who were phagic first, uh, did better in the long term. 
And it's worth noting that new Vedics, the rate of cataract surgery is very high. After TRAB, by six years after a TRAB, 85% of my uveitics are pseudophagic, which is way, way higher. If you compare something like the SIGET study, where the rate of cataract surgery was, uh, was something like, uh, I can't remember, 10%, uh, two or three years out, that was thought to be very high. Uveitics, it's, it's up to 85%, it's much, much higher. So we moved on and the world modernized and we came up, we developed, we found the Zen, and the Zen seemed to have particularly good results in young uh, white uveitics. I don't know why. Is it because the conjunctiva is healthier? They're not on benzalkonium containing drugs for years. But the uveitic Zen seemed to do well. And um, this patient, as I say, was one of my star patients. Pressure of 60 untreated, 28 on medication, 37-year-old white female with sarcoid. A year later, pressure was uh, 12 off everything. Uh, two years later, it was 19 on, uh, on dexamethasone for uveitis. And we wrote up uh, <coughs> this uh, series in clinical experimental ophthalmology. And uh, they actually kindly wrote an editorial as well. What should the in-focus microshunt do the same? Well, that's a good question. And we recently presented uh, 24 eyes at the American Glaucoma Society uh, in, of uh, UV glaucomas in, uh, with pressure flow microshunt, and they seem to do fairly well as well. There's big case selection um, bias. Obviously, you've got to do, you've got to pick young people with no previous intraocular surgery who have not had years of medication, who have no risk factors for filtration failure, and they actually seem to do well. So what I do well when no failure risk factors, high IOP, relatively healthy discs, Zen, or Zen with Mido, Microshunt with Mido. No failure risk factors, high IOPs, bad discs. In other words, real glaucoma, TRAB with mitomycin. So high IOP, mild glaucoma, subconscious MIGS. High IOP, bad glaucoma, TRAB. These are the no risk factor patients. The risk factor patients, all the rest, basically a tube. And that's, uh, you know, patients who are black, pseudophagic, single chamberized, neovasculars, JIA, BKH, Bechette's books, the, the ones where TRABs just don't do well. Um, and it's worth re remembering that these eyes all have si different aqueous dynamics and they really need uh, to be treated differently. So tubes, of course, it's long been known that tubes actually do well in uveitis. Tony Maltino showed that with his 15-year follow-up in this study. And uh, Rich Parrish uh, in this study of Barvelts. Um, but there are a few patients, and my, my go-to tube is the 101-350 Barvelt. It gives good lo long-term results. But there are some cases where it can bite you badly. And these are the ones that JIA or any kind of uveitis from very early childhood, or cataracts that were congenital cataracts that were needled at an early age behave like severe chronic uveitis as well. And congenital, uh, which I just mentioned, or patients who've had a lot of CPC, but I don't CPC uveitics because the ciliary body is already damaged and I don't want to make it worse. What I do then, it's either going to be a 250 bar belt or a single plate Maltino. <clears throat> and this is a patient, this is a, a young woman who still sees me. It's her only eye. She's JIA. Um, she's aphakic. And we don't see these so often. The JIA patients coming to us these days are much less commonly aphakic. But when I started, they were all aphakic. And they had bad uveitis and they were aphakic. And I put in a small bar belt or a single plate Maltino. And you can keep these people seeing well for 20 years. The, the tubes work well. And in those patients, those severe ones, I never use the larger plates, only the smaller plates. Everyone else, I use the big plate. This is a single plate Maltino. It, people raise a few eyelids every time I tell the hospital I want a few more. We keep two or three for uh, rare cases, but we do still use them. And it's worth noting that uh, as a glaucoma specialist, we get told, we, we get sent patients with hypotony. And I get a steady trickle of people with severe hypotony just from the uveitis, where the uveitis alone has just destroyed the ciliary body. And there's very, very little you can do here other than pulsing intravenous steroids, um, cyclic membrane peeling, 
or just periodic injections of HeLa flow. These patients are hard to fix. What you don't want to do is, is allow a patient to get to this stage by not treating their uveitis enough. What you don't want to do is CPC them in case you make them like this, because a, there's nothing worse than a blind uveitic who's blind just because the pressure's low and you can do nothing about it. If you've got a tube, you can tie it off. But if this patient's never had glaucoma surgery and just got severely fibrosed angle and ischemic damaged ciliary body, there's not very much you can do. And you really need to treat uveitis aggressively to stop them getting like this. This is another patient the same. So that's pretty much it. Summary of my, uh, what I do when, acute angle closure, take it really, really seriously. It's a surgical emergency. Um, surgical, not laser PI, and the visco is important. But also you, do need, also you do need to treat these people very aggressively with uh, steroids. It's not just topical steroids, it's systemic steroids or orbital floor. No filtration failure, high IOP, in other words, mild optic nerve damage, high pressures, subconjunctival mix, uh, severe optic nerve damage, high pressures, or severe optic nerve damage or any pressures, TRAB, if no risk factors, significant risk factors, tube, except for the ones that have a high risk of, uh, of low pressures, in which case I use the single plate Maltino. And thank you very much for your attention. I'm um, happy to ask any questions if anyone's still alive or still awake. <laughs> Thank you. I'm sure everyone is still awake because it was a very interesting topic. Yeah, I was uh, looking some articles that you made with uh, UVID glaucoma and I saw, uh, and you show also the SEN45. Um, yeah. You have a very good reduction, like almost 60% and also in medications, but... Yeah like a 41% of blep needling. So how is your perspective now with this, with this SEN? Do you still use this uh, in these cases? To be honest, um, the, because we've got the micro shunt and the micro shunt's easier, I tend to use the micro shunt. If, if they came up, okay, if Allergan come up with a modified ZEN, and what they've been talking about is a Zen 63, not a 45, with a narrow mm -hmm. injector that does not cause periocular, uh, peri uh, tubular flow. Um, then I would consider it seriously. At the minute, I would say that with a Zen, it's very tempting to do the Mav external. Some of the Americans, especially uh, the New Yorkers, are doing Av external Zens because the Av internal Zen is. Uh, a little too hit and miss, and you need to needle it too much. The in focus mm -hmm. micro shunt, you barely needle. Um, the Zen, to be honest, most of them I would take back to the operating theater these days and revise rather than needling. But if I were to start using a lot of Zens, it would be because they'd modify it to use the slightly larger one with no peritubular flow and ideally slightly longer. Um, and then I think Ab external is the way to go. Um, perfect. Perfect. Much less. So there's a, so there's a, also a, a question that I made for me. Uh, for example, uh, a long time ago we were thinking in the size of the dish of the plate of the drainage device, but now we have a new formula about the size of the lumen and the length of the of the implant. So now we are going to to that, right? For example, yeah. in saying or in focus. For, for the MIGs, for, for MIGs, you're right. For the big tubes, none of them have any resistance. I mean, I use the pole glaucoma implant from Singapore, which is a smaller lumen tube. It, it's a similar, a plate size, it's similar to Barvelt, and it has a smaller lumen. It's uh, 126 microns internally and uh, 460 externally. So it's smaller than a Barvelt, but still quite a bit bigger than an in focus. And, and it, cause, it does have a little tiny bit of internal resistance, but very, very little. Whereas the Zen and the InFocus have internal resistance, um, uh, which, so the length is important. Yeah. So we resolved some questions of the participants. Um, ah, okay. There's a, a good one here. Do you use Ahmed bulb in these cases or only Molteno and Berbelt? 
I don't use Ahmed valve generally. It's too heavy scar. You know, it, it just encapsulates uh, too too uh, densely. The Ahmed valve is a perfect tube for the person who doesn't do a huge number of tubes. It's easier to get right, harder to get wrong. Mm -hmm. but on the other hand, you say if you're not doing very many tubes, uh, should you be doing them at all? Um, the Ahmed valve doesn't give pressures as low as the bar belt, basically. Um, although the bar mm -hmm. belt's hard to work and the Ahmed's easier. At the end, it's easy, right? In the long term, yeah. it's better to put like a verbal implant, right? It's easier in uveitis for sure. And you're, to be honest, in uveitis, you probably get better results with an Ahmed than you would in, you know, the more complicated secondary glaucomas because uveitics tend not to, tends to do, uveitics in general do better with tubes than other groups do. So they'll do better with an Ahmed valve as well. And I think a lot of places in the US, they don't do trabs and uveitics, they just do Ahmed valves. But that's not our practice. So there's other question about uh, angle closure in UV iridic glaucoma. Do you prefer to do like an um, iridectomy and also put like a drainage device in the same time or no. only iridectomy and viscogonoplasty? Like, uh, yeah, yeah. I just, I, these are acute angle closures, so you've you, you got to fix that. And then if they turn out later to have a chronic problem, then you can do a tube or something. But I mean, Doing anything surgical in a hot eye is not desirable. So you've got to do, when the eye is hot, you do the minimum that you think you can get away with. Because if you do a trial, it might fail. You put it in a tube, it might fail simply because the eye is so hot. Um, mm -hmm. And it's, it's messier. I, I don't. Perfect. Mirel, ¿tienes alguna preguntita? There's a question from Dr. Rodriguez. In the cases, um, in the iridectomy cases, for example, what's the your plan? You give them oral steroids a few days before, or maybe uh, how fast did you get in the OR to do the iridectomy? Well, these cases, you you got to try and get them in the same day if you can. You know, these are these are serious. You know, the same day or the next day. So you, you put them on steroids as soon as you see them, you know, as quickly as possible. Um, because the, the, these are, it, this is the sort of condition that, that you can end up being NLP or NPL at, at 30 years old if you're not careful. You know, that, that, that yeah. bad. Uh, rarely these days, but it, it is devastating. It really is an emergency. And um, treatment after the iridectomy, what do you do? The treatment? Oh, steroids and um, see what the pressure is. The pressure often, if the pressure wasn't high beforehand, it often comes down again and you're okay. Or you put them on drops. And if they have a chronic pressure problem, then, then you go back and put in the tube, whatever. Yeah. So there, there's a good one too here in the Posner Schultzman syndrome. Do you take like a sample test? of the aqueous humor? Well, we send them to the uveitis the specialist and get them to do it. <laughs> <laughs> Same here. <laughs> uh, I also saw the other, oh, sorry. It's, it's useful to know about CMV or something, you know, we're not big, I mean, uh, Peace and Fake in Singapore is very big on CMV and I think she does PCR in every single patient probably. And our UVI specialists do some as well, but they don't do it. They don't probably do it as many as they should. Um, but I don't know how, how much it, it does influence the management. If you find CMV or something, then you know you've got something to treat. Um, there's there's, there's a, good a question one here. Uh -huh. about CMV. Uh, or? You, no, you first. You first, Mary. Uh, here, Dr. Car Carlos Alvarez is talking about CMB uveitis with no optic nerve damage and no recurrent episodes of inflammation. Do you consider SLT tube or might be used micropulse? No. Well, firstly, as I said, I don't do CPC. Micropulse is, is diode laser. You're damaging the ciliary body. Um, SLT is generally a waste of time and inflammation. Yeah. You know, you're talking about 
if you're talking about people with pressures of 40 or 50, you know, if the pressure's 40 and you SLT them, what are you going to do? It's going to be 37 afterwards. Yes, yeah. yes of course. <laughs> so for you, no SLT, CPC, right? Because it's... Huh? SLT is used for making money. <laughs> <laughs> or a, a first-line treatment, you know. First-line treatment, is, I think it's okay to do an SLT in, yeah. instead of a prostaglandin. Yeah, you're still, yeah, you're right. If you've got, I mean, this is a very heterogeneous group of people, so it's difficult to generalize. Uh -huh. You know, if you've got a patient with a pressure of 47 or 50, you know, you don't, as much oh, as, of course. yeah. If you've got a patient with chronic, if you've got an open angle and a chronically high pressure, yeah, well, you can SLT them. We don't do much SLT because most of these people, you know, they, this, the swings are more dramatic and, uh, and you're often forced to do surgery. I mean, I, I, got, I got invited to the American Uveitis Society last year very kindly. They invited me to speak at one of their um, annual meetings. And they came up to me after and said, that was great. Um, you know, the problem we have in some places in the States is that we have our patients, the pressure's 50, we want the doctor to put a, the glaucoma specialist to put a tube in and all he wants to do is SLT. You know, and that's, uh, the glaucoma specialists are getting a bad rap because mm -hmm. they're, being, they're taking people with serious glaucoma that really needs urgent treatment. The uveitis specialists know what needs to be done, but the glaucoma doctor is just doing SLT instead of fixing the problem. Do you have any comments about GAT in, in this topic, in open angle, if half open angle, uh, do you Not have really, an experience? I, yeah. I mean, it's not unreasonable in open angle. Um, the problem with angle surgery is the only angle surgery where there are actually any decent randomized trials are the ice dent and the hydrus. You know, uh, everyone says, well, you know, um, GAT or trabectome, these all work well. They, 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 they're going to cause the same degree of pressure going. Obviously, GAT produces much more dramatic pressure growing than an eye stent because you're making a much bigger hole. But on the other hand, GAT is, is causing dramatically more scarring than an eye stent. So mm. what's the long-term efficacy going to be? I don't know. But if you think that the barriers of trabecular mesh work, which it may well be, then uh, in some of these patients, then there is a reasonable logic for using GAT and people certainly do do it in the, with the high pressures and uveitis. Mm -hmm. Uh, there's a question from Dr. Kurt. Yep. Uh, first to say hello to you and uh, what a beautiful lecture. I wanted to know if in your experience um, you have closed uh, angle, uh, acute co closed angle presenting to you, but with an infection, infectious nature, uh, uh, like... Uh, uh, VKH or, or syphilis or something, something that would contraindicate using cortisone as a first line? No, the only ones, the, 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 the infectious types that we tend to get are like toxo, things like that. And, and you're still treating them with, you're still going to treat them with steroids because it's the inflammatory component that's the problem. Syphilis is different, a different ball game, obviously, and I, I've not ever managed one, an acute one, in that situation. I'd have to ask the UVI specialist for advice on that. But it's typically, um, the, the ones that typically I see are people with just very severe acute anterior uveitis, um, uh, VKH, as you mentioned. We, even the VKH, I see very, very little acute VKH. Uh, it's largely chronic, and I rarely see angle closure from it. I see more angle closure from toxo, uh, even from tuberculosis, would you believe? Um, but, but in those cases, even the TB, you still got to put steroids in the eye to get rid of the inflammation. Right. Uh, TB is, is um, growing very much in Mexico. There's a, a, a great... Uh, um, a number of patients, of new patients having that. So this is something to take into account. Mm. Mm -hmm. I think one of those ones I showed at the start might have been TB, actually. 
I mean, it's not, it's not TB acute angle closure is not common, obviously, but TB is common, getting common. So, but in the end up, you still got to treat the inflammation in the eye and, and obviously treat the infection as well. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Thanks, Dr. Kurt, for participating. <clears throat> There's another question here. Uh, how much do you wait for a tube after uh, you treat that patient with iridectomy? Well, not all of them need tubes. <laughs> um, <laughs> It really depends. You're treating them very aggressively. You've opened up the angle. Usually you're getting decent pressure control afterwards for a while. So there's usually, you're talking about usually several months later, not weeks or days. It's usually not, the tube requirement is usually not so urgent. There's a question about prostaglandin analogs. You talk about that in your uh, presentation, but Dr. Yeah. Paulina says, um, what's your experience in non-infection uveitis, uveitis and in patients with no cystoid macular edema? I, you know, um, my colleague Sue Lightman did a paper showing that there was some benefit from prostaglandins and uveitis, but my experience has been that they're less effective than the aqueous suppressants. But I still use them, you know, I, I just, it, it, people get very high pressures. I, I'm cautious about using them. I often stop the prostaglandin because I'm not sure that it's reducing the pressure or even, you know, prostaglandins have a very strange dose response curve. You put too much prostaglandin in the eye and the pressure goes up. And uh, if, you're, if you've got prostaglandins in the eye already and you're adding a little bit more, you can be adversely affecting the pressure. It does. No. So you have also a study about uh, consecutive bilateral glaucoma surgery that was very interesting. And you have like two groups, one with tube and one with trap. And at the end, uh, you saw that tra the traps uh, have like a 30% uh, of them, of that group required, required like a secondary procedure. And you conclude that was better that you in all these cases uh, what was that? That was, yeah, I, I didn't show that. We found in the, in the pseudo fake, the ones that had already had cataract surgery did worse. Mm. Um, the ones that did worse overall actually were the Fuchs. And, you know, you don't think of Fuchs as being a serious damaging uveitis, but the Trabs did worse than any other Trabs. And the pseudophagic ones did worse again. So pseudophagic Fuchs, I tend to just do a tube to start with because I know it'll work and the trabs often failed. Mm -hmm. um, but the, if, if they're not, if they're phagic to start with, I still tend to do a trab. Trabs okay. seem to work well in phagic guys, even if they need the cataract surgery later. Mm -hmm. Is there anyone left? <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Francisco asks Basically. if you use vitamin C in your velvets. We discussed that, that in the elder mm -hmm. lecture, but. Yes. Yeah, uh, I, I, I do. Um, I don't use them so much in uveitics. Because there's a risk in the severe uveitics that you could get chronic hypotony. And mm -hmm. it's hard to, if you get chronic hypotony, from a tube in uveitis, it's hard to fix, you know, you, because each time you tie the tube off, the pressure's 40. If you, you know, if you put a super mid inside the tube, the pressure's 30. If you take it out, the pressure's zero, and you go up and down and up and down. It's very hard to get them right. So the severe uveitics, I never uh, use mitomycin with, with the tubes. Everybody else, I use uh, mitomycin. And what did you do if you have like a, hop, a, a hypotony in traps? How is your manage there? First thing is go back in and uh, restitch the flap. If the, if the, if the flap is, um, you know, if, if it's a reasonable flap and you can put in stitches, then I stitch it. If it's a really thin flap, like a, like a watering can, and you can't stitch it, then I take a piece of pericardium and suture it over the top of it, over the flap, mm -hmm. and then put the conch over. I basically fix the flap. Okay. 
and you know, uh, one of my colleagues used to joke that my traps that my traps work well. And what he was trying to say was, I have a lot of hypotenuse I need to fix. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and uh, I um, go back. Uh, you know, you when you're doing traps and uveitis, you have to tie them. You have to put in more stitches than usual. They get more low pressures. And in that case, you have a low percentage in, I think, in, I think one case only in 745, you take it out? If I what? The low pressure was in then? Yes. Uh, never happened. Well, yeah, I got, we had some early hypotony with Zen 45, but we, ne we never had any chronic ones where we had to take them out. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, and I think we solved everything. There's like two questions about micropoles and CPC, but you also comment that, but can you um, make a conclusion about what's your uh, point of view in that, in uveitis and CPC? I don't do CPC and uveitis, period. I mean, people do, you know, do gentle CPC, <laughs> whatever, but, but I've seen too many uveitics get chronic hypotony that you can't fix. Yeah. And, what, and you don't know which patients are going to end up like that. And CPC will push them in that direction. Okay. Yeah, that was very important to clarify for exactly. everyone here. Yeah. <laughs> There's a lot of questions about that. And in your traps, you use vitamin C also in cases of uveitis? Oh, yeah, I use traps, all the traps of mitomycin. All the traps. Yeah. No. And all the Zens and microshunts, all of mitomycin. Mm -hmm. So I think we're okay, right? We solved everything. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, you know, you know my opinion on everything now. If you haven't told I, I miss, uh, you know, my colleague Sheng Lim, every time I would stand up and say this, he would say, I disagree, I disagree. <laughs> <laughs> well, I love that when that's happening, you know, that's <laughs> controversy is, is, is really good in a, in a presentation. Well, All right, Miriam, I think, yes, I think everyone is know. telling you, thank you, Keith. Everyone, are we everyone done? Is, Thank yes, you, everyone. I think... Thank you so many attendees. <laughs> Podemos abrir los micrófonos para darle un aplauso al Dr. Keith, por favor. Thank you, Keith, for participating again. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Pleasure. John? Yes, we're done. I, I will show you the number of participants. I will send you that okay. to you to have. Thanks. Pleasure. All right. Bye. Be safe. Be safe. Be Bye. Yeah, bye. Thank you very much.